Good evening. Uh, tonight's lesson is going to be on Pentecostal Experience Continues. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to say that this has been a good day, and um, I want y'all to uh, be continue uh, lifting Brother Gary up in prayer. I've had him, <coughs> excuse me, on my mind uh, all evening. I want us to continue to be praying for him and a need that he has in his life. And um, also, I uh, want to give God glory and thanks because he's doing great things with our church, with, and not only outside of the church, as right now we're doing some remodeling, but inside the church. I see a lot of people that are encouraged, and uh, that's a good thing. We need to take courage when we look at the things that God is doing in our lives. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started and just ask the Lord to touch us tonight as we study this uh, lesson on Pentecostal experience. Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you, God, that not only in Acts 2 when the Holy Ghost came into the upper room, but even today it says as to as many as would receive and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that's for us today that the Holy Ghost is still empowering people, is still touching us and working in our lives. Father, I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to the scriptures that we're going to be reading tonight. God, give us understanding, God. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that we would always be pleasing to you. God, we thank you for every miracle that you're performing in our families and in our local church. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, tonight's lesson uh, on Pentecostal experience, it says God's will is that every believer in Christ be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And to be baptized means to be fully submersed in something. And do you know that's the way we need to walk for the Lord every day? We need to be uh, fully led by the Holy Spirit. We need to have our hearts tender before Him and pliable so that when uh, He unctions our heart that we listen to that Spirit. We need to be uh, fully in tune with God's Spirit and let Him lead God and direct our steps. And if we would do that, it would be so much easier in our Christian walk. Uh, I think that that's one thing people say, well, I, I really don't understand uh, about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. It's simply God's Spirit with us. He said, Lo, I'll be with you to the end of the world. And we know Jesus has ascended. He's seated at the right hand of God. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, He's still here with us today. And we know this because in one place, Jesus has said He was talking to His disciples and, and He said to them, uh, the Scripture said, He breathed on them. And he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. He was about to send them out so that they could make other disciples. And this Holy Spirit he talked about was the very Spirit of God that dwells inside of us and it goes with us and it gives us power for services. We go out and work with people and tell them about the Lord and try to get them discipled. So the lesson overview says Pentecost Sunday the seventh Sunday after Easter is observed by Christians as a reminder that the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church occurred on the Jewish feast of Pentecost. That is 50 days after the ascension of Jesus when, uh, when he had ascended and went back to the Father. 50 days later, you remember he told them to go and tarry and they tarried in that upper room. They waited for the Spirit of God to come. So uh, 50 days following the ascension of Jesus Christ. Pentecost Sunday is also observed as a reminder that God is still pouring his spirit out on believers in Christ. Because as the apostle Peter declared on the day of Pentecost, this promise or the gift of the Holy Spirit is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. And here we are over 2,000 years later. We're pretty far off from that experience, that initial experience. But God's Spirit, God is not limited by time or distance. His Spirit is still striving with us today, still working in the earth. And it's the only thing that is keeping peace, keeping the earth from ultimately coming apart. We see a lot of chaos. Uh, we turn on the news today. We see people that are so full of hate, people that are wounded and they refuse to give up uh, feelings of animosity and things. Uh, you know, two wrongs or three wrongs don't make a right. 
And as God's people, we need to remember that when the world is in chaos, we can be at peace because his spirit is with us and it's in us. And as long as God's spirit's with us, we can have peace. But let's go back. It says, as many who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, who's eligible for the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit? As my Baptist friends would say, as many as God has saved as many as the Lord calls, that Holy Spirit can be with you and reside in you, and he can lead you into all paths of righteousness. Uh, It says, it's for all the believers in Christ, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit is a continuing experience. Every day we live, every day we learn, and the goal should be to get more and more Christ-like. And and how do we do that? We allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to change us as we spiritually mature and walk following in the footsteps of Jesus every day. Uh, The lesson outline, and and there's, there's six of them here. I'll read them tonight. I won't break it down into sections, but it says the Samaritans receive Christ. And it says in this group of scriptures says they receive the word. Well, who, who is the Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So they were willing to receive Jesus Christ. They were willing to be baptized into the same death that he had died. You, you know how Jesus told them. He said, you're going to have to die out to the ways of the world. See, baptism, uh, it, it, in a physical sense, it's where we go and we're fully submerged in the water. And it, it's an example that shows the world. It represents the death and burial and resurrection uh, into that new life as a believer. But uh, they were willing to receive the word of the Lord. They were willing to receive the gift and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And it says the Samaritans receive the Spirit. When did they receive it? When they yielded to it. When they had faith for it when they believed in him. And, and uh, let's, let's go back here just for a second. It says God's work, uh, or God works in unexpected ways. Now, you know, this was unexpected because at the time that the Gentiles, as we're going to read in this group of scripture in a minute, at the time the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, the Jewish people, this really just blowed their mind because uh, up to this point, it had only been for the Jewish people and uh, people of circumcision, people who had covenant with God. And so the Jewish people didn't understand how God could allow the Gentiles who were uncircumcised, who were not under this covenant with God, uh, to receive that gift. But God, He works in ways, His ways are higher than our ways. They're past our finding out. We'll never understand him. And thank God that he extended that gift of the Holy Spirit, not only to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. That's me and you today. But I want to go back here just for a moment. It says God's will is recognized. What is God's will? That every individual that is saved can receive the Holy Spirit And in the church of God, the way we teach it is uh, that uh, we know you receive the Holy Spirit. It it is evidenced by the initial evidence of it is speaking in other tongues. And and, and a lot of people, they misunderstand. They say, oh, unless you speak in tongues every time you walk the door, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've seen people that received the Holy Spirit. Initially, they spoke in tongues uh, and only very rarely. Would they speak in tongues? But they're still believers. They still love God, and the Holy Spirit still works in their life. They just may not have the gift of tongues. And uh, I've seen people who literally had the gift of tongues. And every time they were in church, you see them speaking in tongues, and they're so happy in the Holy Ghost. And that's good, too. But as long as you let him have your heart and your mind and lead you, you are you are a child of God, and you are full of the Holy Spirit. Um, it says that there were some uninformed disciples in those days. These were people that John the Baptist, he went about and he was teaching repentance unto baptism, or in other words, after he told them you need to repent of your sins, then you need to be baptized in water. And they, they were uninformed because the only thing they knew is to do what John told them to do. And John was telling them, do you believe in the Lord? Yes, we do. Repent and ask him to forgive your sins, and then I'm going to baptize you in water. And they did what they were told to do. But they were uninformed about uh, the, the, see, you are drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and you're, you're saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And people say, well, the Holy Spirit, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you're saved, but that's not true. Because it, later in this lesson, we're gonna look where Paul asked him, said, have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit since you first believed or since you were first saved? And they said, we've not even so much as heard there was a Holy Spirit. So they couldn't believe and receive what they didn't have any knowledge of. They needed to be discipled, they needed to be taught. They were drawn by the Holy Spirit, they were convicted by the Holy Spirit, they were saved by faith in Christ, but they were an empty, clean vessel waiting for something. What was that? Where God would pour out that gift once they were discipled about the Holy Ghost and they would acknowledge the power of God and receive it, then God would fill that empty vessel. They had been saved, they had been cleaned and sanctified. See, we, well, a lot of times we don't hear people teach on sanctification anymore. You hear people say, I was saved and I was filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, somewhere in between those two experiences, when you got saved, that means God forgave you of your sins, but now you need to be sanctified. How many of you would want to drink out of a cup that had been dirty for 25 or 30 years or ever how long somebody had been lost in sin? That's the same way with God. He's not going to come into an unclean temple. He will save you. He will forgive you of your sins. He will sanctify you. Well, we hear a lot today about using hand sanitizer and using all these disinfectants. We want, we want things to be clean. Well, God wants his people to be clean too. He wants us to be sanctified. And once we're sanctified and that Adamic nature has been eradicated, it's not our first nature to want to sin anymore. We want to have peace with God and please him. Then we are clean, willing vessels that God can fill with the Holy Spirit. And then it says, uh, the next step in, uh, in the lesson outline says, the Spirit baptized disciples. When were they baptized? When they believed, when they were willing to accept it. The Holy Spirit is a gift, and a gift is exactly that. Uh, I can bring you a gift, and I can say, here's this gift. I, I want to give you a gift. And you say, I don't want your gift, and I won't receive it. Well, I'm not going to force you to take a gift, and God's the same way. The Holy Spirit is a gift, for as many who will believe and as many as will receive, but the Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He's not gonna force himself on anybody. And, and some people say, I'm not happy in the church I attend, or I'm not happy with this or that. God does not hold prisoners. Uh, he wants you to come with a willing heart. He wants you to come and like David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And when we come in a spirit like that, God will fill us, uh, fill us up. Oh, to the point of overflow. And that's where we want to live in our lives. We want to live in the overflow of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, people say, well, there's so much negative in the world. And, and just for a moment, I, I'll just stop and just tell you about a situation uh, today. A Andrew had a little fender bender. He, he was backing up in the parking lot and don't know if it's his fault or the other lady's fault, but all of a sudden, wham, there's an accident. And and probably a couple thousand dollars worth of damage on his car and hers. And, and he calls and he said, oh, dad, now I could tell in his voice he was upset. Well, you know, the small things in life, when we're a child of God, you see a lot of times uh, people who don't know the Lord, they, they get really upset. They get flustered in situations like this. But if you will allow the Holy Spirit to, to just have rule in your life. You know what I said? I said, son, are you okay? Oh, I'm okay, dad. I said, hey, everything's gonna be fine. Uh, if nobody's hurt, that's what insurance is for. And we'll, we'll deal with this. Just come on to the house as soon as they do the report and everything will be fine. You know why? Because we're always gonna have trouble. The Bible says man's days are short and full of trouble. And if you don't ever have trouble, I, I need to spend some time with you and let you rub off uh, that off on me because you know, as a child of God, we experience things every day. And the only way to have peace over those things that comes into our life is by letting the Holy Spirit rule and reign and bring that peace into our heart and in our mind. Uh, the golden text says, then remembered I the word of the Lord. How that he said, John indeed will baptize you with water. This is talking about a physical baptism. John brought them down literally into the Jordan River and he submersed them in water. But the Lord is telling us something here. It says, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. 
John was baptizing them physically, but the Lord is going to be baptizing them spiritually. You know, we have a physical man and we feed. I'm really good at feeding that physical man. You can all look at me and tell that. But do you know, as much as we want to feed the physical man, we should want to feed that spiritual man every day. How do we do that? We pray, we read our Bible, we, we, we uh, be in unity in our churches with people that are like-minded, that worship like we do. And that way God can keep us filled up. He can speak to us through worship and praise and through the word. God is speaking every day. If only we will hear. The Bible says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. How do we hear the Spirit when we have him living with us and in us? then we can hear him. Uh, teaching goals in this lesson. Uh, the, one of the teaching goals is that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is intended by God to be a gift for every believer. If we can uh, accept Christ and in our hearts and minds, we know that he is our savior, that gift is for you and everybody else who will receive it. Uh, the second teaching goal is to influence attitudes that we should have a great appreciation for the power of the Holy Ghost that works in our lives as believers, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit working in us. Isn't it wonderful to know that God loves us enough that he gave us his spirit as a gift, that it will never leave us, it will never forsake us, and it will go with us from the day that we are born again until the day that we die. He never leaves a child of God He's with us, and that's that peace that we can experience. And also to influence behavior, uh, we want to welcome the Holy Spirit. We want to host him. You know, uh, as a pastor, and I, I, I'll guarantee you other pastors would agree with this. If you see a service going a certain way and you feel the Spirit of God moving in that service and the Holy Ghost is working live with your people and he's convicting hearts and people are lost in worship, you know what I do? I back up and I let God have it because that's his house. It's not my house. It's not your house. It's the house of God. So we yield the floor. We give over to the Holy Spirit and we say, we're giving you rule and reign in this service. And when that spirit lifts, then God gives the anointing by the Holy Spirit for the minister to take the pulpit. If he does not lift and he's still working with the people, he can have the service because it's his house. And, and a lot of times we miss blessings because people don't know how to remove their self and get out of the way and let the spirit of God do the work. Being a child of God is not a hard thing. It's an easy thing or it should be, amen. Uh, the historical background, all scripture for this lessons are from the Acts of the Apostle written by Luke. How many of you knew that the book of Acts was written by Luke? Uh, not only just the book of Luke. So uh, it says, also the author of the gospel, uh, it, it, it's by his name in the book of Luke. But in fact, the book of Acts is a sequel to the gospel of Luke. The book of Acts provides a brief but extremely important history of the early church from A.D. 30, the year of Jesus' death, uh, resurrection, and ascension, to A.D. 63, the year that the Apostle Paul was released from the custody of the Roman government in the city of Rome. Luke is the only New Testament writer who tells about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the subsequent outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the early churches. Again, how did that Spirit come? Jesus said, it's, it, it, it is exceedingly, it's needful, uh, it's expedient for me to go away because if I don't go away, then you won't receive the Comforter. He said, but if I go away, I will send another. I will send you the Comforter. And I thank God that that Holy Spirit brings us comfort every day in our lives. And, and that's, that's what keeps us uh, to where we can serve God no matter what comes or what goes, no matter if we have uh, good things to happen uh, on a Monday or a Tuesday or bad things to happen. We know that God loves us unconditionally every day because his Holy Spirit is with us. In Acts 8 and 14, it says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that, the, uh, that Samaria had received the word of God, what is the word? That they need to receive salvation. 
that Jesus had come and he is the Messiah and they need to accept him. So it's saying when 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 the the Jews figured out that the Samaritans had genuinely accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, they received the word of God. Then the Jewish leaders sent Peter and John to them. Why? First, they wanted to make sure that what they had heard was really what was happening, that they were truly repentant. They were true believers in Christ. It wasn't just a rumor. And they told them, they said, Peter, John, y'all go and check this out. And not only to verify what was happening with the Samaritans, but also when they got there, if it was true to teach and disciple them. And see, that's what we need. A lot of times people get saved in our churches today, and we, we're so happy that they got saved. People pat them on the back and hug them, and, you know, we expect them just from that point on just to come to church, to love the Lord, to read the Word, to be faithful tithe payers, but they don't know these things. They're babes in Christ. They need to be trained. They need to be discipled and taught, and that's what Peter and John were there for, to disciple, not just to verify, uh, to verify, but not only to verify, but to teach and disciple them because the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So they needed to train these boys. And it says in verse 15, who when they had come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John got there. They verified that they were believers in Christ, that they had received salvation and now they said, we're going to lay hands on you and we're going to anoint you. We're going to believe that God is going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. That is the power for service. People say, well, um, you know, do you believe you can be saved and, and be lead a Christian life and not have the Holy Ghost? I've seen people do that. It was extremely hard for them to live for the Lord because that Holy Ghost is what brings comfort to us. In times where we don't know the next move to make, the Holy Ghost, he's the one that leads, guides, and directs. When you're in ministry, that Holy Ghost, when you get in the pulpit, he's the one that when you yield to him, the anointing comes. And, and even if you were to lose a train of thought, he, what the Lord says, he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. Just open your mouth and I'll put the word in your mouth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit, by the anointing that comes through him in our ministry. And it says, they prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. So people who say, well, when you get saved, you're automatically filled with the Holy Ghost. It's a, it's a spirit thing. You're automatically, when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit. That's not so because, li listen to what it says here now. It says, they had believed they had, we know they had already confessed their sins. They were true believers in Christ. Peter and John had verified it. But even though they were saved, verse 16 says, for as yet the Holy Spirit had fallen on none of them. They were saved and they were empty vessels. They were willing, but they didn't understand about the Holy Spirit. They had to be discipled. And it says, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They believed in Jesus, but they were not yet spirit filled. And it says, then they, that is Peter and John, laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They were anointed men of God who were full of the Holy Ghost. And when they prayed over them in faith, believing, along with those people who were praying to receive, see God, he, he sends his Holy Spirit to people who are willing. He sends his Holy Spirit to people who want to yield. You have to yield. You have to humble yourself to receive the Holy Spirit. I remember back in the 80s, a lot of young people had a problem with that. They said, oh, I'm scared if I receive it, I'll dance in the spirit or I'll fall out on the floor. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you won't care who's looking or what they think about you. You'll be so glad to have it. And you can't be ashamed or embarrassed of him. I am so proud that I am a Pentecostal believer and that I know that his, his power for service is living in me. And you should be too. Never be ashamed of the Holy Spirit in your life. It says they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who had heard the word because in faith, when we believe, it unlocks the door and it brings the promises to us. And the Holy Spirit is a promise from the Lord. It's to, it's to those who believe then and it's to as many as the Lord our God would call, even afar off, that's us today, 
That promise is still in effect for us today of the Holy Spirit. And, and it says, and those of the circumcision, in other words, the Jews that had went with Peter and John, it said uh, they were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, they were all astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Isn't it wonderful to know that God can do things in our life that people can't even imagine? They can't even fathom what God can do for you. Uh, I remember when I got saved, I had led such a wicked life. It took two or three years for people to be convinced that I had gotten saved. It didn't slow me down. It didn't deter me, not one bit. I knew what God had called me to. I knew who I had living on the inside of me, and I wasn't looking for, for validation from anybody. I just want to please the Lord. As long as I please him, I could care less what a man thinks. Because a lot of times when you please God, it's not going to please a man. But one day we've got to stand in front of God. We've got to give an account. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. How am I going to be faithful in a few things? I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead me. And look what it says here. It says, and, and all of them were astonished that came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they had heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? When God does something, we can't, uh, we can't deny it. Uh, we've got to accept it when the Lord does it. And Peter says, hey, you've seen them. They're saved and they're spirit-filled. Now they need to be baptized. And you know, that's what we need to be doing. We need to tell people, you need to be saved. You need to be sanctified. You need to be spirit-filled. You need to be baptized. Come and go to church with us. Why? Because we need the word. We need to be discipled in the word. And you know, it's sad. But today, so many people take it personal when you're preaching the gospel. Uh, if the Bible says, don't lie, don't steal, don't fornicate, don't commit adultery, uh, all these things, uh, don't hate your brother, don't be jealous of people because jealousy is as cruel as the grave. When we deliver that message to you, it's just like you, maybe uh, in life you had taken out a loan on an automobile and you're not paying for your automobile payments and you're two or three payments behind. The mailman brings you a letter and puts in your mailbox. And the letter says, Mr. Jones or Mr. Smith, if you don't make a payment on this car, we're coming next Tuesday to repossess this car. And then you get angry at the mailman because he brought you the letter. It's not the mailman's fault that you're about to lose your automobile. That's your fault. Amen? And do you see the gospel is the same way. Ministers of the gospel we're delivering the good news that Jesus is not his will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And not only that all of them would come to repentance, but that all of them, no matter whether they were Greek or Jew or Gentile, no matter what they were, God wanted to save them and fill them with the Holy Spirit. God's still that way today. He's no respecter of person. And, and see, a lot of times we do things, we bring consequences into our life and then we blame God for it or we blame the ministry for it when the blame belongs on us. What if these men had never accepted Jesus? What if they had never accepted the gift of the Holy Spirit? They wouldn't have been in a condition. They wouldn't have been in a place where they could receive what God wanted them to receive. See, we've got to get our mind right. We've got to get our heart right. When the word comes to us, if the word offends, we need to go find a place and get on our knees and pray to God until we know that we know that we know everything is under the blood, that everything's okay between us and God. And these men had done that. They said, we know who we are. We're Samaritans and you Jews, y'all consider us trash because you know what You know what a Samaritan was? It was, a, it was not a pure-blooded Jew. 
It was a foreigner, uh, maybe had come into the country, and, 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 and they had a marriage between a foreigner and a Jewish person, and the offspring, the children uh, of that foreigner and that Jew would be a Samaritan or a half-breed, they considered in those days, and a lot of the Jews considered them trash. They said, they can't receive the Holy Spirit like we can because we're so whole. It's not about us. It's not about how good we are. It's about how good he is and how God can do anything. He can save anybody. He can change anybody. He'll change you too if you will open your heart to him and your mind and you'll let that Holy Spirit come in. God will change you. And living up to his word is no problem when you love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and you'll want to keep his commandments then and you'll want to follow the Holy Spirit then because you're sold out to God And when we can't do that, it shows lack of commitment on our part. Amen. So we need to be committed fully. We need to be fully submersed in God's Holy Spirit. And then God can do great things with us. And Peter said, we need to baptize them immediately. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. Why? Peter wanted them to make a public profession of faith. So you got people today say, oh, I know I'm saved. I was baptized in my church. Baptism, if you have not really accepted Jesus in your heart, the only thing that's going to do is get you wet. You have got to have a heart change because when you are getting baptized in water, it's just an outward expression. Uh, it, It just tells everybody in the world, I've got something on the inside of me. I have fully surrendered to Christ. I'm a new creation now in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, and I've died out to the sinful nature. That's what you're telling the world. And In Acts 11 and 15, it says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, Indeed, John will baptize you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 19 and 1, it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? In other words, when you got saved, did you push forward? Did you, did you move toward God and go ahead and let him give you the full blessing and fill you with the Holy Spirit? And, and listen to what they answered him and said. It says, they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. See, we take for granted that everybody knows what we know, that everybody has been raised in a Pentecostal experience and everybody has not. You've got people in certain denominations today, when you say the word holiness, they act like they want to get sick at their stomach. But you know what? I pray for people like that because the Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy, said the Lord, for without holiness, no man shall see God. I I, I, I use that scripture all the time. Why? Because if God said you've got to be holy to be saved, I want to make sure that I'm walking in the holiness lifestyle. I want to please the Lord when I die one day. Uh, Let's go back to it. It says, he says, have you received this? And they said, we've not even heard there was a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said to him, into John's baptism. And we all know that John was the forerunner of Christ. He was telling about Jesus But for some reason, they had missed it, and all they knew was that John was preaching, you need to repent from your sins and walk in this water and let me baptize you. And do you know what they answered him when he said, uh, what were you baptized into? They said, we were baptized into the baptism of John. Well, do you know, if you're following a preacher today, you're doing the wrong thing because Preachers are just a mouthpiece for the Lord. We need to keep our eyes on God. It's not about us. It's not about John the Baptist. It's all about Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody try to try to get you to follow uh, a one man or one certain uh, uh, set of people, group of people. We need to be sold out and following the Lord because we've got to have relationship with God, and we have that relationship through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And it says, then Paul said, John indeed baptized you with the baptism of repentance, saying to people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is, believe on Jesus Christ. Even John himself said, don't look at me. I'm pointing to another. I'm telling you about the one that's about to come. And he was, he was letting them know, I'm just a forerunner for Christ. And what's going to happen? I'm going to baptize you in water. But this water is not anything. You haven't seen nothing yet. He's going to baptize you in something that's going to give you some power. And we need that Holy Ghost. We need that power. I think that's what's missing in a lot of our church services. Just about every service we have at Faith Family, you see people with their hands in the air, speaking in tongues. I've seen people laying on the floor. You, you, you know why? We're not ashamed. We love God. We want that Pentecostal experience. That's where the power is. The power of Pentecost. It said it blew in Acts 2. It blew into the upper room, and it said it had the sound of a rushing mighty wind. There's power in the Holy Spirit. It's the very breath, like Jesus, where it said he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's the very breath of God. It's that Ruach spirit that we need, that spirit that we want with us every day. That's what helps us to serve the Lord. And it says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. In other words, the Spirit was using their mouth to tell things that were going to be happening in the future. That's the reason I love reading the book of Revelation. God used John to tell about future events that would take place those events are unfolding around me and you today. We're seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled every day if we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want to go a little further here and read. It says, the Samaritans received the Spirit. The Samaritans were descendants of mixed marriages between Israelites and Gentiles that occurred after the northern kingdom of Israel had failed to the Assyrians in 721 B.C., after the captivity, the Samaritans were forbidden by the Jews to worship in the temple at Jerusalem. Thus, they were isolated from the Jews. And then the Samaritans developed their own religion that was based on the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And it says that this all centered around a temple that they built for themselves on Mount Gershom, about 30 miles north of Jerusalem. The Bible asks us today, says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? I want, I want to read a little more here. Let's go. It says the Gentiles received the Spirit. It says a few years after the day of Pentecost, the Jewish believers in, uh, in Jesus as Messiah centered in Jerusalem and Judea, and they had made no significant effort to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. Then God intervened to redirect the church into fulfilling the great commission of making disciples for Christ of all nations. When God redirects us, when God uh, moves in such a way to change our thinking, when he shines light onto our path, we don't need to resist and fight that. We need to go with that redirection. We need to walk in what God is pointing us toward. How does God uh, move us and guide our steps? He does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, this redirection of the church began with God commanding the apostle Peter to preach the gospel to the Gentiles of Cornelius' household. Peter obeyed God. Look at what wonderful things happen when we obey God. What if Peter had not gotten up? What if he had not gone to Cornelius' house? You say, well, they wouldn't have received. Yes, they would. God would have found some man that was a willing vessel, and he would have used that man to ha have that miracle take place because God, he always, he doesn't, God doesn't have to have us. He can accomplish the things he wants to because when his word goes out, it never returns void. But Peter was obedient. When he got up and went to Cornelius' house, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit because they believed the words that Peter spoke to them that God placed in his mouth. And they said, we want that gift too, just like you have. We want that same power that we see working in you. Um, 
I want to read, uh, God's will is recognized. In making his report to the church at Jerusalem about the Gentiles at Cornelius' house, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, Peter said the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. In other words, Peter said, just like on the day of Pentecost when it blew into the upper room and filled everybody in the house, the same exact thing I saw it happen at Cornelius' house, and the Holy Ghost has also come to them. It said, Peter identified that the Gentiles receiving of the Holy Spirit and the baptism in the Spirit, uh, uh, the baptism in the Spirit was Jesus promised to those who believed in him. He simply stated uh, that he had observed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Gentile believers, and he believed that it was a repetition of what had happened on the day of Pentecost. Therefore, the leaders of the church at Jerusalem concluded that God had granted the Gentiles repentance unto life. See, we have to be drawn by the Holy Spirit. Unless you are drawn by the Holy Spirit and convicted, you're never going to repent of your sins. People say, well, I'll wait till uh, two months before I think I'm going to die, and then I'll repent. Uh, I've got plenty of time. But see, the Bible said God's Spirit will not always strive with man. Do you know what it is when you're sitting in a revival? You're sitting in the back of the church. You know you're backslid. You don't know God. Do you know what it is that grips our heart and will grab that pew and there's a struggle that's going on inside of us? Do you know what makes us walk down that aisle, kneel down on our knees and humble ourselves in an altar and surrender to God? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It says the fact that John the Baptist uh, had disciples in Ephesus, even in A.D. 54, think about this now, who were prepared by his ministry to believe in Jesus as the Messiah and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit shows how far-reaching and how long-lasting was the influence of the forerunner of Jesus the Messiah. God works to prepare people to believe in Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever your ministry is today, you may not see fruit yet, but it's going to affect someone because God's word, when the Holy Spirit anoints it and it goes out, it will never return void. It's going to accomplish what God wanted it, wanted it to accomplish. The call to discipleship, and this is the last part that I'll read here, it says, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, we are commanded by Scripture to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to live a Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered life. This we can and should do because it is God's will. He said, as many as the Lord our God shall call, even afar off, it's his will for us to be spirit-filled believers and follow him and walk in the spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit, and those that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would touch all of our churches. God, our nation is going through a very difficult time right now, Lord. Several things, God, uh, have attributed to that. We've got people that are in financial trouble right now because maybe they're unemployed. We've got people who have been sick with this COVID. God, a lot of them are our older people. They've been sick in their bodies. And Lord, a lot of our churches, uh, they have been closed and people are just now starting to come back into your house. And you know, we need the Holy Spirit now today worse than we have ever needed it, God, because when we have the power of the Holy Spirit working on the inside of us and ruling and reigning in our minds and in our hearts, we're going to have to love one another. We're going to have to love people of different color. We're going to have to love people that preach the gospel. We're going to have to love everybody around us because we're going to walk in the Spirit, God. Touch our people tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that this upcoming weekend, Lord, I pray that you would unleash the power of the Holy Spirit. God, that we would have a spirit of revival that would start in our nation, God. And Lord, that you would touch all of our leaders, God, that they would feel that spirit, God, and it would lead them and give them wisdom 
how to lead our nation, Lord. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Be blessed tonight, church. Amen.